Thank you, Todd. No. All right. Well, then, I'm going to be talking about personal manufacturing and uh, the GATA Prize, which is a new uh, cash-based prize uh, with Humanity Plus, and a bit about the future of technology. I was hoping to pause for effect here. Yes. So anyway, um, what is transhumanism? Well, in my opinion, transhumanism, uh, in a very simple phrase, is personalized human enhancement. So improving yourself, building yourself from the stone which you're made of. So what could this possibly mean? Well, this could mean personalized medicine, uh, DIY genomics. It can mean whole genome analysis. It can mean whole brain emulation. It can mean molecular nanotechnology. It can mean intelligence augmentation, life extension, um, synthetic biology. So what you have to realize is that working on any one of these problems, even in some slight contribu contribution, is very valuable, even if you don't become a billionaire working on it. There is still value to be had from this, even if the business models aren't quite there yet. So this uh, unicorn will be making some appearances in my presentation to make some predictions about the future. There's going to be no software patents in the future. There's going to be really, truly synthetic life. Um, Perhaps Venter will continue to work. And uh, there will also be post-scarcity. So that'll happen, according to the unicorn. Uh, also, um, Kurzweil's law of accelerating returns applies to personal manufacturing and personalized enhancement. So all of these technologies that are contributing back and forth to each other do, in fact, apply to transhumanism itself uh, when you approach it to the human body or the human individual. So. Um, I'm going to start the story off with the Gutenberg Press. Um, so back in high school, my teachers always explained that, uh, in the literature classes in particular, that the Gutenberg Press freed writers and authors, and it was a new era of freedom in literature. Well, it turns out that Gutenberg built this machine, and it was proprietary. So that means that he built it, and he sold it. And uh, to this day, printing presses are still following that same business model or at least people who build printing presses. Um, so the amount of freedom involved in publishing on a mass scale has never really been as much as uh, available with the internet and computers. So we got uh, actual 2D printers for uh, paper, um, and they started off very large. And now we have portable printers that can sometimes attach to the back of your laptop. Uh, this is another copying machine that you, wait, no. This one you might be familiar with. This is uh, what you're seeing in the gel photo. This is polymerase. It copies your DNA all the time. It's just a different form of a copy machine. This is another one. This is a printer that prints out 3D objects, kind of like the previous one, except this is mostly only out of plastic. There are other materials. This, this machine in particular is a Stratasys, and uh, that man is very happy to be holding his printed object. Uh, so this is another type of printer. This one is Enrico Dini out of Italy, and he prints very large objects, and sometimes in the news they'll talk about him printing out buildings and so on. And so uh, this is a very large structure, and then there's two average people by it. And you can see here that there's a giant arm that moves back and forth on to construct its object, and uh, inconspicuously placed in the landscapes on uh, Google Street View. So. The RepRap is an open source 3D printer that can print its own plastic components. That means you can go to the website reprap.org, download all the schematics, and uh, place a lot of orders on different websites, and eventually get parts to build your first RepRap, and then use it to build the next version of your RepRap. Uh, this is, for instance, version two of it. Uh, Slightly different framework, it looks a bit different. It's essentially the same function, somewhat cheaper. This is another one where a company called MakerBot Industries took the RepRap platform, in particular, a, there's, there's a whole family tree of these 3D printers now, and uh, commercialized it. And uh, you can now buy these kits for about $700. Or if you want it to include everything you could possibly need, including some extra components and so on, you know, $1,000, $1,200 or something. Uh, and in particular, if you're wondering how this works, um, plastic comes in from the top there, and uh, the platform moves around, thus 
making your 3D object out of plastic. It's kind of like a hot glue gun or putting icing on a cake. Uh, so the unicorn predicts that the cost of 3D printing will drop substantially. Um, right now, you could probably make a 3D printer like the RepRap for about $300 uh, if you have already been making them. Uh, so if you needed to actually get equipped and everything, it's going to cost a bit more. But this cost is substantially less than paying $50,000 for a Stratasys 3D printer. So the Gata Prize is uh, originally from the Foresight Institute, and it was particularly made to encourage innovation on top of the RepRap platform to meet some specific goals uh, that I'll list momentarily. And so the idea is that we'll award $20,000 by January 1st, 2013 to the individual or team or groups of individuals who meet these specific criteria points. Uh, in particular, the idea is that we want this printer to be able to print electronic circuits, PCBs, to be able to print plastic still, as well as other materials. Uh, keep the cost under $200 for the entire thing, not, not including shipping costs, so that people in uh, Sweden can still participate. Uh, and it must be able to print its own parts unattached from a computer, unattended by a human, within 10 days. Uh, and there's like one exception if you get the print head stuck or something, you can go clean that out. Um, and also, it must use no more than 60 watts of electricity. You can find out more at gotaprize.org. So that's really exciting. And um, in general, this is kind of part of a broader movement already happening. This was an interesting guide published uh, last month called It Will Be Awesome If They Do Not Screw It Up. And it is about 3D printing and uh, personalized manufacturing and the concepts of uh, copyright law, patent law, as it applies to open source hardware. So open source software we might all be somewhat more familiar with. Open source hardware is new, and there are some particular issues in between the differences of copyright law and patent law that need to be resolved or more commonly understood. Um, so in particular, to, to go into that, software started with copyright. Because as soon as you make a creative work, you are granted a copyright under US law. Uh, open source said, OK, well, we want to be able to explicitly say, you are allowed to copy this if you allow everyone else to copy this. This is where we get the GPL license. Patent law, on the other hand, is a bit different because you are not immediately granted a patent on your invention, like a 3D printer. So if you don't have a patent in the first place, you can't really sublicense these rights out and say everyone else must keep this open source so that other people can contribute to it. Um, now, if you do happen to have the patent, you can do something like that. But then all of the people uh, who base their work off of you don't have that option since they don't own the patent. Um, so another problem uh, and reason for the book that, or I'm sorry, the guide that was published, it's not really a book, it's more like 40 pages, is that um, in mass society in general, everyone is fairly primed for the model of proprietary innovation. So that means when little Jimmy invents something, you tell him to go get a patent. And people understand this model, and there's a business model behind intellectual property rights. Well, there's not really that sort of social infrastructure for an alternative to that yet. And if this is going to happen, that has to be either removed or supplemented with something that uh, works. So if you have a 3D printer, what are you going to build? I mean, what does this have to do with transhumanism? Well, do-it-yourself biology is a group uh, formed over the internet of people who believe that they should be doing biology work outside of academic and institutional settings. Uh, there's a great deal of projects going on in the community, some that aren't as dangerous as you might think, um, and others that seem a bit odd such as uh, making your yogurt glow in the dark. Not particularly practical in terms of a business, maybe, but it is certainly enjoyable. So I had to include a graph. This is a graph of the news-based popularity of DIY Bio. There has been a massive amount of public uh, publicity and media coverage. This is actually a cumulative graph of the number of articles um, per month since uh, 2002, and um, there are some interesting trends, actually, or uh, just points to point out. Wired got to it pretty much first, um, and then the New York Times and NPR picked it up. They even did a video bit on it, and uh, Slashdot just got to it, so anyway. Uh, so anyway, 